Hey everybody, welcome to Will Taylor Music and Strings Attached, and I apologize for the slightly disheveled look, and uh, I'm glad you've decided to come on board with me for this fun journey around the prelude and e minor of Chopin and the art of tonal ambiguity is what I'm calling it. So, if I were to play these chords right here, can you hear that? Actually, let me take this out. If I were to play this chord, or if I play this chord, right there, what do you think about that? Or if I were to play something like this, uh, would you imagine that coming from around mid-19th century? A composer writing in the mid-19th century, like around 1820? Okay, these are moments that are in a Chopin prelude, and a lot of jazz musicians have been very influenced by the music of Chopin for a good reason, as you can tell. So if I take these moments out of context, they sound very dissonant, this, right? But if I uh, play them from a standpoint of not horizontally, but vertically, I would call literally, li literally, like a line, you know, in time, they make more sense, right? So what I want to do is I want to go through this prelude by Chopin and see what gems Chopin has intentionally placed in the actual score that are really cool. But the thing about this piece is, you know, what, what, how can we look at it? Is it, is it a gesture of moving from one place to another harmonically? Is it a gesture of taking us on this kind of nebulous harmonic journey? And uh, this, again, video is for people that are interested in music theory, that are interested in what goes into the making of a piece of music. Some people think that composers just sort of, like, spit these things out. And sometimes they do. They dream them up. But other times, they, they are very calculated, and there's intention that is woven into the score. And I'm going to show you the score here and just go through my interpretation of it and see, see what's there, and you can come along for the journey. So this is most... This is Chopin's Prelude in E minor. Chopin was born in 1810. And I think it's amazing some of the things in here that would be considered almost wrong notes in the sense of classical music. Um, let me just play a couple little sections here. But like if I played something like this, this kind of deal, which in jazz is normal. So you, you would call that a flat nine, or actually a sharp nine. And Chopin uses that technique a lot, the having a D-sharp followed by a D-natural, D or a C-double-sharp. So, I think it's really interesting to pull back the layers and look at the tapestry in the actual music. So I'm going to turn over to the music now, and let you guys see what I'm seeing. So as you can see, we start from the five. The note, the actual so-called melody, which is pretty much going around in half steps here. So we've got a B. The first chord is not even in root position. It's in, it's in this first inversion. So we know we're in E minor, right? OK, let's figure out what's going on here. So the very first chord, we have a nice E minor in first inversion. So that gives us a sense, of, okay, we're in E minor. But I think it's really interesting to note that we have this octave uh, five. Let's look, let's look through it and just kind of see what's happening. Okay, then we have, now, what's cool about this is, the melody then becomes kind of the missing note in these following chords. So, if you were to put that B down here, you would have what we would call a B7 suspended with, with the F sharp in the bass, right? Alright, so, so the top note, the melody, starts to become the missing note. Now we have the resolution there, right? And then... 
put that B down in the chord below, that spells out an augmented sixth chord, okay? Right? So between F and D would be a normal sixth. So you've got F natural, but you've got a D sharp, so you've got an augmented sixth chord. And usually what those chords do is they resolve outward like this. So you've got an F and a D sharp. The D sharp goes up to the E and the F goes down to the E. And that would be a five of your next key. So, so it would be like going to A or A minor. But he doesn't do that. So we've got the we've got the B natural. I think that's called the French augmented sixth, right? Because it's got the B natural would be like a flat flatted fifth, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, theorists out there. Okay, so we're in this bar right here. So instead of going to an E, right? Then he lowers this down to your now, now we've got a, on this chord right here, when he lowers the D sharp to the D, what does that, what does that make? That all of a sudden makes what we call a half diminished chord. So the missing note, which is the melody, goes right in here. So we've got, we've got F, A, B, D. If I spell that out, that actually makes a B half diminished chord. Now, then when he lowers the, the A to a G sharp, that gives us a full diminished chord right here, right? And now we're down here. Now we're on it. We got E, G sharp. The missing note, again, he's leaving out in the left hand, that which is the melody. So it's very calculated. That's an E7 or an E dominant, right? If you spell it out, and then he lowers the third. So we got a minor. The next part right here. Now we're down to now we're on an E minor seven chord. Now if I lower the D to a C sharp, now we have a full diminished. If I spell that out, that's going to be a C sharp diminished, right? Now what's cool is that there's a nice little sixth melody, sixth harmony going on here between the the B flat and the C sharp, resolving down. Right, the A, the B flat goes to an A, and the C sharp goes to a C. So we've we've got this diminished chord resolving to a beautiful A minor seventh on this guy right here. Right now, here's a cool technique. If I spell that out again, that's going to be A minor. So every again, if you think of the missing note. The top melody is again missing note, A natural. If I play that whole chord, if I just play it like that. Now, when we get to this chord, we got the F sharp. Now we've got another half diminished chord. Now we're playing an F sharp half diminished on this. And then we have a dissonance. This is the first time that the melody actually is not a part of the chord. It's really just a appoggiatura. It's a dissonance. This B natural right here. And then and then he keeps it the same. I'm on this measure right now, right? And now, what do we have there? Now we've got a full diminished chord. So we're playing around with half diminished, full diminished. We don't really know where we are harmonically, right? Okay, now what do we got next? We got the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I jumped ahead. <laughs> now we're gonna go to the D sharp here. dominant chord. That A is the missing note right here in the chord. So what? what is that chord? If you're watching, you're curious. It's a D7. So we got D, F sharp. The melody up top is, is the fifth. And then we got the seventh here on the C. Normally that would probably resolve to some kind of G. Right? Like that, right? But does he do that? No. Let's keep looking through here. So the B natural becomes like an appoggiatura, so it's a tension note, right? Resolving down here. Now he makes it a minor seventh chord. So he did this before over here. If you remember, he went to a minor seventh chord here. So here we're now, again, that missing note, that A. See, it's again, he's keeping that, kind of playing around with that missing note. Isn't that beautiful? So what happens next? Now we got the B going, the C natural resolves to the B, so that brings us back to a 
another half diminished chord. <laughs> All right? If you put the missing note, the A, right there, then you have a B half diminished. Now we get this G sharp, which makes it a fully diminished chord. He did that before, too. If you look back over here, same deal. So he plays with that kind of s subtle tension, half diminished, going to a full diminished. So if I'm here, at the end of bar eight, right? And then I could, if, you know, which might resolve, if you resolve it classically, it might go to a, to a normal, like an A minor, right? But what, he, what Chopin does is he goes to this, which is kind of, this chord right here is sort of like a five dominant over the minor. Because if you look at it, it does that right here. Finally, we get to the one. So at this point right here, we have a nice resolution into the A minor first inversion. Just like what? At the top, we had an E minor first inversion. So we kind of have an arrival here of a nice, I don't know if you can see that. Let me put it down a little bit. Right here. So we've got this chord. Which if I play it, the beginning of the measure right here, can everybody see okay? Let me see. This down here a bit. So, in this measure right here, we've got the five, which is like, it's kind of like a five over the tonic, which if I were to play in a different way, it would sound like this. Okay, but we're doing it over the C. And then we got the one. section right here is kind of sits in A minor, but, and this G sharp is so far from E minor, right? Because that would be E major. Okay, but now we start working our way back to E minor, right? So really, we're kind of still in E minor here. We're just playing over the four chord. So if we were thinking of chords, if we're in E minor up here, we've reached the four chord in A minor, right? Now we're down to five, right, a suspended. Now let's look, does he keep doing that missing note idea again? If you look at the melody right up here, the F sharp, yep. That's the missing note in the chord, right? So what would it sound like if I had that note du duplicated below? It would sound like this. So it's very efficient that he's using the missing note mostly up in the melody, right? Okay, and then, thanks Eric, appreciate it. This is this is fun here, I'm just having fun with this. All right, so we're going along, missing note, and then back up to what? With that missing note that makes it a half diminished again, so we're messing around with half diminished, but it's really kind of that A minor sound, right? In Latin music, you have, they, they instead of playing, they play a lot with this. You'll hear that, that F sharp, that raised sixth degree, so. In a way, we could say this is this measure right here is just hitting the four chord again, and then back to the five chord, and then F sharp again is the missing note, and we're just repeating it. Okay, right, we're on the, the four chord. Now, here's what's really cool, kind of cool. This next section here, bar, bar 12. Let me go down a little bit so you can see. Bar 12, we kind of hit a, a phrase ending, right? Now, look at this top melody, again, missing notes. If we take, if, I think he's not going to have an F sharp here, so he lead, leaves the ambiguity up in the melody. All these notes, playing around with the uh, dominant. If I just play this phrase without any chord, just, just the melody. I mean, imagine that. That was written in, in the 1800s. I mean, it's like a jazz melody. So this melody right here that I'm playing. So we've got this kind of appoggiatura, G natural. If I just play that by itself, right, it's a it's an augmented chord. And then it resolves to the normal, and then we got the flat nine, the C, which in classical terms is like an appoggiatura, right? Going to the B, now the D sharp, F sharp, and then flat nine, uh, sharp nine. And now we're back 
We're repeating exactly what's at the top. Now we're back here. Same thing, same music as the top. So the whole first measure, this whole repeating, first measure, and then the same thing, and that's where he takes the departure. Now, you guys, based on what I've already done, you could go ahead and see that it's, he's doing the same missing note thing. But if we look at this piece, and we kind of notice, it's kind of playing as a, gi a giant gesture from here to here, is this descending line. This keeps going. It starts at a G, and it's going all the way down to the 5. So it's kind of like a move movement from the 5. We've got the melody right up here again. I'm sorry is B, and look down here, we have landing on B. And then we, uh, we kind of state the similar material again, but have some variation and go through. So he's got, and one thing that was really cool that, let me put down here. All right. Uh, this part down here is really interesting. This is like a climax of the piece. Starting here at bar 16. I'm not going to give it all, all to you. Diminished stuff going on right here, right? As again, again, that G is missing, and then F sharp that makes it a half diminished. Now here we are hitting the five, right? Now check this out. Here we got this. Uh... Oh shit, sorry. <laughs> Not a pianist. Okay, I'm looking at this chord right here. here, which is like an augmented major seventh, if you look at it in jazz terms, right? This chord right here, augmented major seventh, you got G, B, D sharp, F sharp, but it's really just like a five over the one, right? Because it's the way, that's the way it resolves. And then we got the D natural coming back in over the four chord. All right, I'm just going to go ahead here, and you guys can analyze it more. You can see what he basically does. You know, my my teacher used to always say, "Will, when we're looking at pieces by great composers, think about how you could make it any better. Is there any way that you could make the piece better?" And I always thought that was that was really hard. Looking at Mozart or Beethoven, you know, and trying to make it different or better than they already had it, it makes you realize how perfect, in a way music is. So let's go here. And uh, maybe I'll try that real quick as an exercise. So we got this, again, missing note, right? F sharp is not in the left hand. He just keeps, now we got a, a nice five chord there. Puts the seventh in. Going to the sixth chord. Now B flat, right? Not A sharp, because we're resolving down to the A. Now, now you might go, let's go to that, right here, C chord, right, which is a 6 chord. Oh, now if you spell that out, F sharp half diminished, right, which would be what, a 2? So we got 2 here, 2 chord going to this, is what? It's five suspended. Now you think that would go to this? It could go to that, right? This first feel, but no, he goes down to a G sharp, so far away from E minor. But how does that sound right? That's just it does, right? Ah, oh, so gorgeous. But then E minor here. Okay, so we're now finally we got this E. When we hit here really planted in E minor, right? And then F sharp, nice little arpeggiatura, going to an A sharp at the bass, which is what? Augmented sixth chord all of a sudden. I love that. So we've, we've traveled from way over here on the left hand side, a G all the way down to the augmented sixth, the A. So gorgeous.
then we have a, a six four cadence, which acts as a five, right? These two chords act kind of as a five together. Let's see. Okay. Let's see. And then yeah, one five one. Oops, sorry. All right, have fun with that. I think it's beautiful. How can we make that better? Is there any way we can make different choices? You know, let's look at the top. I'm just, I was gonna try that really quick. Let's look at the top right here. So, anything I can do differently from Chopin? What if I did this? <laughs> right there. Nope, that doesn't make it better. What if I did this? Let's try this. So instead I put a C. That kind of sounds cool. And now I go... Anyway, I, so I, what I did, instead of an A, I put a C, and then had the B. So here's my, my, my edit. And then the left hand goes to a C. Which I don't think is as cool, but it doesn't sound bad, right? Now what am I gonna do? Let's see. Uh, no. Nope. Anyway, just an idea. Uh, have fun with that, and thanks for watching behind the music with Will Taylor. Will Taylor Music. Share the video, and let me know if you have any questions or ideas for future analyzations. I have one idea for a. The next video is going to be about wrong notes versus wrong resolutions, or there are no wrong notes. And I'm going to show examples of what in some ways might be considered wrong notes, but people like Beethoven, Mozart, Chopin were able to pull off doing this, breaking the rules. Like you've got to know the rules before you break them, right? So it's going to be fun. I found some really cool examples. Uh, Beethoven, Chopin, Schumann where they've made wrong notes actually sound right because of the way they resolved them. Okay, we'll see you guys out there in the mu world of music. Thanks again for watching Will Taylor Music and StringsAttached.bandcamp.com. We'll be doing more of these soon.